Hello, I'm Gavin Clark, and I'm talking to Mark Priestley, Research Fellow at the National Museum of Computing at Bletchley Park. Among Mark's many achievements, he last year won the Bernard S. Finn History Prize for his article, Colossus and Programmability. Hi, Mark. Hi, Gavin. <laughs> Good to have you with us. Now, May, May the 8th, 2020, marks the 75th anniversary of Victory in Europe, v, uh, known as VE Day, the day which is remembered as the, the end of the Second World War in Europe when German powers surrendered to the Allies. Mark and I in 2019 worked on an exhibition at the museum on how Colossus and Bletchley Park had influenced the Allies landing in Normandy, which was D-Day, which of course set the war in Western Europe on its uh, treadmill motion towards Berlin and of course VE Day. Bletchley Park was the place where German, Italian and Japanese military messages that had been encoded were decrypted using new and um, specialised and groundbreaking computers um, to find out what the enemy's plans were and to find out what the enemy was thinking. These machines undoubtedly helped uh, influence the outcome of the war and allied actions and saved many, many lives. We wanted to recap on D-Day and look at the run-up to VE Day itself. Also, we were curious to find out what happened to the pioneering computer systems, these some systems that had changed the course of the war and broken the enemy, enemy messages leading to that ultimate victory in Europe, of course. So, Mark, I guess let's, there's so much to discuss here. We haven't got too much time, but briefly, they start this clock running as it were at D-Day. What was Colossus briefly? Uh, what did it do? Why was it introduced at D-Day? So the first Colossus came into operation in January or February of 1944, about four or five months before D-Day, um, and was used to break messages passing between Berlin and Rome primarily, and then later on Berlin and Paris, which was obviously um, uh, of great importance to the to the lead up uh, to D-Day, to for the Germans to know what the uh, German command in France was was thinking and reacting. What scale of messages were they processing and, wh and why were these things so fiendishly complicated? Um, at that stage they were processing um, tens of messages per day. I mean the, the, there were more messages than the, the decryption capabilities could cope with that stage. They were really trying to pick out the most important ones. Um, as, we, as we talked about last year in the D-Day celebrations, I mean the, the, the uh, a lot of the important messages were around to the German preparations for D-Day and the German reactions to the to the Allied um, deception plans. I believe we were talking that on a daily basis, Bletchley Park as a whole was receiving some 20,000 messages, um, which were being encrypted by Lorenz, which is this very complicated encryption, advanced encryption machine, and, and also by Enigma, which is uh, another of the German encryption machines. Now, obviously, we've discussed uh, Colossus, but it, it, it didn't stop at that, did it? There was an, a whole industrial process of, of many more machines at Bletchley Park. How did they, how did they scale up the operations in the, in the, I suppose, in, as the war progressed and as, as ultimately they led up to VE Day? Well, the, on the, for the Lorentz codes, I mean, they started mechanizing the process in 1943. And the, the first machine was, a, was called Heath Robinson, came into operation in um, the middle of 1943. The Colossus machines were a response to the um, experience gained with that machine. Um, the first one in January, second in June 1944. And then from then on to the end of the war, they produced Colossus on a monthly basis. So by the end of the war, there were 10 Colossus machines um, occupying kind of four or five large rooms at Bletchley Park and producing you know, um, an industrial scale cryptographic attack on these um, uh, very complex German codes. I mean, they were supported by specialized decoding machines, machines for tape preparation. And then once the, once the Colossus kind of attack had got established, um, the, the code breakers looked for other ways to attack these Lorentz messages, including uh, what they call reading cribs, which was good at looking, the, looking at the, the, the known text of a message against an encrypted message and looking for kind of coincidences and bits where the text mm. would reappear. And this was equally a, 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 an important part to their armory in, in, in breaking these um, messages. And specialized machines called um, dragons were um, created to, for, you know, to, to mechanize that part of the attack. So Colossus was really part of a, uh, a large kind of decoding factory, very mechanized decoding factory to, to maximize the, the output they could get from this particularly, uh, this particular German coat. Uh, code system. And I understand, I mean, the human scale is impressive too. I mean, when it opened in, well, opened, uh, when business started in 1939, there was about 200 staff, and we believe it scaled up to between uh, 9,000 and 12,000 at the height of Bletchley Park, all working in shifts around the clock. Um, I understand there are about 500 staff or so working on the, just on the Colossus, that's just getting the machines working. And that's never mind the, the deep encryption and decoding behind the scenes. What was the German response to this. I think you know you know a lot about this because the Germans never really knew. They never really twigged to their messages being 
broken as uh, such. That, that, I, think, I think that's correct. I think that's correct. Um, but what the, throughout the time the Germans were using this code, they were continually making um, improvements to the, the, the encryption method itself and also their kind of organizational procedures in an attempt to make it more secure. Um, towards the end of 19... And, and, and these improvements kind of, kind of funnily enough, dovetail with the introduction of some of the important events in the Colossus life, life story. So, for example, at the end of 1943, the Germans introduced a, uh, a another level of encryption, which made uh, one of the techniques that Bletchley Park had been using. Um, they couldn't use it anymore because it, it wouldn't work with these newly encrypted messages. But the, 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 the approach that the Colossus machines were using um, did work. Uh, so just as the Germans made this change, the first Colossus machine came along to take up this increased workload that was necessary because of this um, this German improvement. Um, so in a way, Colossus kind of saved the day there. Uh, and again, towards the middle of 1944, um, the Germans started changing the codes on a daily basis, whereas before some of the codes were only changed every month. Um, and this this obviously greatly increased the workload of the um, the Berkshire part of decoders. Mm. And again, this is the point at which uh, additional Colossus machines started appearing on a monthly basis. Um, and they hadn't, they, hadn't, they hadn't planned the machines, knowing that the Germans were going to make this change. Um, it just, but uh, as, it, as it turned out, um, the, this, this production line of Colossuses were just what they needed to um, handle this increased workload that the Germans had put upon them. Mm. So the, the whole thing, like again, a game of cat and mouse. Um, the, the mouse didn't quite know what the cat was doing. Well, I think also, and as you, you, you pointed out earlier, that as VE Day was approaching, of course, the German military was being pushed back further and further. Um, the wireless network became increasingly mobile, I think, didn't it? Which became a, became a problem for, for Bletchley Park. People trying I think this to is, yeah. Themselves. I think this is particularly in the period where, uh, towards the end of the war, the Germans are retreating and the, the Allies have crossed the border into Germany, kind of west and east. And the German army is in retreat and obviously much more mobile. So it's before in the war when, when the, the wireless transmissions were taking place from fixed army headquarters. Uh, later on, when they were moving around, um, obviously the fixed location, they could, the Allies could no longer use that as a way of identifying which radio communications were sent by whom and on which code. So they needed a lot of um, information simply about the German, uh, the German wireless network to help them uh, break into the codes in the first place. Mm -hmm. And since January 1944, um, the group responsible for the, the Colossus group and the, the group working with the Colossus machines on the Lorentz codes had had a section performing what, what they call traffic analysis on the on the fish messages, which is basically just analysing where the messages are coming from, uh, how long they are, what time of the day they're being sent, all this kind of sort of um, contextual information about the messages before you get anywhere near actually trying to decode them. Uh, and this this section also built up through 1944. So mm -hmm. by, by the, the last few months of the war. Um, again, this, they, they could provide a lot of crucial information that told the codebreakers where to look and what message, where to find the messages, mm. and which messages to look at for the best to get the best chance of decoding useful messages. Mm. Um, and of course, they were they were getting lots of information as, at that point. I think that the, the coin had kind of switched from this almost very structured um, from from D Day, uh, where it had been very structured preparations by the Germans. To by this point, we're looking at um, orders that are completely out of touch, being intercepted. You know reports on food shortages and attacks by the resistance. For example, he told his commanders to sum up their, submit their, their plans 36 hours in, in advance for his advanced approval. Of course, not reflecting the chaotic situation on the ground. So the code breakers at Bletchley Park were getting this information for, and getting a real insight into the, the collapsing nature of the, of the German military by this point, I believe, through, through the systems they had there. Yeah, no, I think that's correct. I think at the beginning of the war, the, the messages were far more, the, the, the Lorentz messages were of more strategic value. So, VE Day, bring us up to date. So the war's coming to an end, it's winding down. Um, you've got a, an industrialised uh, code-breaking uh, factory at uh, Bletchley Park, just outside of Milton Keynes. Uh, you've got, you know, hundreds of code-breaking computers, uh, the bomb system, which we've not even talked about yet. Um, you've got the Colossi, of about 10, 10, 12 of those systems. Surely Britain is at this point is poised to leap into the new world of the Cold War with these fantastically advanced computer systems and break the encrypting, encryption and, and communications that are going to be emerging from their soon to be rival the Soviet, Soviet Union, aren't they, Mark? That didn't really happen, did it? What happened? Um, it, well, to, to answer your question, but I was thinking about the Colossus machines first. I mean, the thing about the Colossus machines was that they were very specialised machines, customised to give the most... Um, optimal response against the messages uh, encrypted by this Lorentz system. They were very specialized, which meant they were very fast and very capable, but also they're not very flexible and couldn't really be repurposed for um, other code-breaking tasks after the war. There is a story that um, 
uh, Churchill himself ordered that the machines be destroyed at the end of the war. Um, I haven't seen any ev any actual hard evidence in the archives um, to support that story, but we do know that the decision was made to preserve two Colossus machines, which went to the organisation after the war, went to the organisation that became GCHQ, mm -hmm. and I believe they, they were they were not broken up until 1960. Um, the remainder of the, the the other eight Colossus, eight or nine Colossus at the end of the war were, were broken down. Their parts were basically sent back to storage. I mean, mm -hmm. a, lot, a lot of them were built out of sort of standard GPO racks mm -hmm. and valves that could have other you know, were a scarce commodity in post-war Britain. So they were broken down for their components. Um, Max Newman, the, 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 the man at Bletchley, Bletchley Park, who'd been responsible for the mechanising the attack on the fish codes, um, took a number of these parts to Manchester, where he was setting up a project to build a, a high-speed electronic computer after the war, mm. which is an intriguing link. That we don't know for certain whether any of the Colossus parts were actually used in the Manchester machine. I mean, mm -hmm. I suspect maybe not, because there were other influences on, mm. on that machine. Um, we should mention in this context the, the Robinson machines, which was another series of machines based on that um, Heath Robinson prototype from 1943. Um, they were, in some ways, uh, more flexible than Colossus. Colossus was a real, uh, Colossus was a thoroughbred for one, for one task. The Robinson machines were slightly more general mm. and had potentially wider application. Uh, I think four Robinsons were kept and sent to GCHQ after the war. So they used, they used, they, they kept the, they obviously had gained an extraordinary amount of experience on how to break these mechanical codes and mm. preserved the machines for like research purposes. I doubt whether, I mean, a lot of the story is based on, is, is still very highly top secret, of course, but I, I would doubt that these machine, the actual um, Robinson Colossus machines were, were usable, particularly for attacks on Soviet codes, but the experience that the Allies had gained, and particularly the very strong collaboration between the British and American coding uh, decryption organizations, uh, are, are certainly carried forward into the early Cold War era. Thanks, Mark. That's some interesting stuff. So the, the hot war had finished, but the Cold War was just about to begin, and but at least while the machines weren't useful any longer as such, at least the, the skills that had been acquired were, and, and they, they would have fed through into the post-war intelligence operations against the the Soviet Union, who of course were the, the new enemy in the post in the, the post World War II context. That about wraps up our discussion today of, on from D-Day to VE Day, of course. Um, but don't forget, you can uh, speak to all of our experts at the National Museum of Computing. Um, simply uh, fire a question at us uh, via Twitter using the hashtag #AskTNMOC. And don't forget, of course, we're uh, raising funds for the for through for the museum through our crowdfunder. Please just check the website. Once again, Mark, thanks very much for your time. It's a pleasure. Thank you.